Okay, good evening everybody. California Lawyers for the Arts is proud to present Music and Music Memorabilia, Overlooked Assets in Plain Sight. Mm -hmm. We are very happy to have with us Mr. Stephen Brighton. He is an expert and accredited appraiser from the American Society of Appraisers and one of the few accredited in this field. Now, he has served as an expert witness on such things as the Michael Jackson auction through that estate, and I believe he's also appraised the, uh, the collection of Sir Elton John yeah, <laughs> and uh, Mr. Niles Rogers. Okay. Take it away, Stephen. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank quick, you. Quick, quick thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, welcome everyone tonight uh, for this presentation and for you who are seeing it online, whatever time of day it is. My name is Stephen Breitman, and I am a, an accredited senior appraiser affiliated with the American Society of Appraisers. And we're here tonight to talk about how music memorabilia, which is a very broad topic, as you will see, um, how that can be important in various issues you may be approached by clients with property issues, property settlement issues, divorce cases, uh, various litigious issues, and we'll get into some of those. What I'm hoping uh, to end up with from on your side at, at the end of this is to know a few things. When you're confronted with a collection of music memorabilia, you'll have some, at least a superficial knowledge of how to examine that material and know whether it's worth considering it. You'll be able to know whether there's assets that you need to investigate further because they may not be declared immediately. Uh, you'll learn something about some of the major issues that uh, collectors and dealers and auctioneers come into uh, conflict with each other that affect appraisal values and other issues. And in general, some of the major issues that are inherent in this field in record collecting, music memorabilia, both on the auction side and the sales side. So just in general, I want you to leave with the idea that if you're confronted with any of this material in any of your situations, you won't feel completely out to sea, that you'll have some some information that will give you some insight to what you're dealing with. So with that, let's just ask a couple questions. So here's a diamond ring. Is that worth fighting over? Diamond <coughs> rings can be very expensive, so it might be something worth fighting over. How about an automobile, whether it's a you know collector car or not? Is that worth, worth dealing with? How about a puppy dog? Puppy dogs, animals, yes, pets. Yes, oh yes, everyone loves their pets, and divorce cases are often notorious for fighting over the pets. What about this? What about like an old beat up record, old 45? You think that this might be worth fighting over? Well, here's one reason I'm here tonight. This particular record sold for auction for about $35,000 a few years ago. This happens to be a very rare Motown recording by a guy called Frank Wilson. Now, no one knows who Frank Wilson is. Well, we know who he is, but he's not a musician, he's not a star, but he was a in-house producer for Motown. And Barry Jordy, one point said, well, you know, let's just see if we can record you. So they recorded this 45 the single, and it didn't work out. They decided not to release it, and they destroyed all the copies that they pressed of it, but there were two cap copies that were discovered in the 70s, and it happens to be a kind of soul music that a lot of collectors look for, and the last time it sold at auction, $35,000, the rarest, most expensive 45 ever sold at auction. So. The reason I brought this up is to show you that there are things that occur in this field that no one can calculate. So you never know what's going to happen. As a result of that record becoming very valuable, everyone started looking for lots of other records that might be valuable. And you can understand then that it's a very emotional field. There's a lot of high emotion in music, in what people love about music, in what they're looking for in music, and what they're guarding against others in music. And there's four issues, four areas in which emotions run high in this field. So I, I put down divorce cases. So it's so typical that the, the wife, and it's usually the wife, doesn't know what the husband, it's usually the husband, has collected over time and is in the basement or in the special room or in storage, you know? And if 
the wife doesn't know and there's a divorce and there's dealing with property settlements, well, the insurance company doesn't know and the lawyer doesn't know. Similarly, with more property settlements, say, in, in, a, in a, a, a case where someone has sold something to someone else. And, you know, Dad wanted me to have those Beatles albums because he loved them so much. Well, the daughter or the other son is saying, no, I want them, right? Well, are those Beatle albums worth, worth fighting over? Well, you know, generally, they are, so we'll see. And in states, states uh, issues, you know, uh, when you're dealing with tax issues and, and the, the courts, Someone's going to invariably say, you know, that's just a bunch of junk. Let's just, you don't have to deal with that, okay? But it needs to be vetted. You need to know if that really is just junk. And then, of course, another issue among buyers and sellers, whether we're dealing with just one-on-one -on -one at, a, at a store or a major auction house like Sotheby's, you said this was a mint copy. No, this isn't mint. It's, it's, it's very good. No. You said this was authentic. No, this is, this is, this is a phony. So there's all sorts of issues that you need to be aware of that come up. And again, emotion runs high in this field. So let's, let's we're gonna look at some of these issues uh, over the course of the evening. But first I wanna tell you really what I do and how I can help. So what is a music appraiser? Well, like any appraiser, I can appraise the valuation of materials. I'm a specialist in music related materials and that means not just records but posters, discs, signed instruments, awards. We'll get into all the various types but it's specific to that field. Now uh, as an appraiser I'm accredited with a professional organization, the American Society of Appraisers, American Society of Appraisers, the ASA, and the ASA has given me an ASA. I'm an accredited senior appraiser. I'm an ASA of the ASA. That's just the way they do it. There's another organization called the ISA, International Society of Appraisers. I can be an ISA of the ISA. So that's just the way they deal with their designation. But it, it means that I have undergone a certain level of training, uh, of passing of tests, of experience in the field, and of knowledge. I've taken various exams through various courses over time. Um, consequently, as a result of that, document methodology that is used in various legal circles. It can be used in tax issues with the IRS, it can be used in the court for expert uh, witness, etc., etc. So basically that is some of the, the aspects of what a music appraiser does. So in that role, I provide you with fair market value or replacement value or liquidation value, depending on the kind of property that is being evaluated and what the purpose is. There's different kinds of value in appraisal. Fair market value, just to be brief, is the common kind of value we look at when someone agrees to sell something to someone who agrees to buy it at that amount. Okay, usually in collectors or even in a store you know, store when you buy something. I'm going to sell this to you. Yes. Okay. Replacement value is the kind of value when you have, a you have a loss of some kind and you need to immediately replace it. So time is a factor. Think about buying a house. You lose your house. You want to buy a house as soon as possible. You don't want to wait around for months and find the right house and, and bicker with the buyer. You just want to get a house. So the value in replacement value tends to be a higher dollar amount than fair market value because time is, is a uh, aspect of that. Liquidation value is de generally the lowest kind of, of prices that you find because it's, there's some compelling need to sell as soon as possible or to buy something you know, in, in those circumstances. So if you, you, you're going to jail in two weeks and you got to get rid of your record collection or your art collection, that's liquidation value. You're just going to get rid of it. That's liquidation value. So in all of this, of course, there's various uh, litigation uh, cases in divorce and damage and loss claims and lawsuits that I can help in finding the kind of value that you need to state your cases properly. Uh, in general, I'm seen as a consultant, right, and, and in offering advice on how to position property in various ways, 
depending on their value, and a lot of collections are not highly valued, so, but there's still an issue of what to do with them. Other consulting things I can help with is, is the background research needed to establish provenance. Where does this come from? Is this legitimate? What is the specific edition? Is this a first pressing of the most highest value or is this a subsequent pressing? Uh, so basically it's coming to the idea that if you have to make a defense, or in, in some cases I can offer that information that can help provide the answers for you. Obviously I've done some expert testimony and I've been cross-examined in, in a couple of circumstances, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to go too much on this information, but there's the, some of the ways that I can help you. The reason why you might need an appraiser, because of various issues that come up, and we've already talked about them. So contested results, you know, discovery of these hidden assets. You said this wasn't worth anything, but it is. So how, how are we going to solve this issue, okay? Insurance adjustments. Uh, when you file a claim and the insurance company says, well, how much is this worth? If you haven't had an appraisal done, the insurance company tends not to pay full replacement value unless you have an appraisal. So that's one important issue to deal with when you have contentious issues about property whether it's someone who says they have something that isn't what it's claimed to be, or they need it for tax purposes, for donation perhaps, uh, or for other expenses that need to be re reimbursed, say, in an estate issue, okay? Let's just talk about how this works in the real world and how it has worked in my experience. I've called this, it's a world of versus. It's versus you, versus me, versus everybody in this case. So. Let me talk about this one case and how this came down. This was a relatively well-known case uh, with the Michael Jackson estate. Michael Jackson's family, after his death, uh, contacted Julian's Auctions in Hollywood to do a major auction of lots of material that was in the Michael Jackson estate, both in, in Michael Jackson's houses, in his property, and on his estate as sculpture. Uh, I was retained by the uh, plaintiff in this case involving uh, the Michael Jackson family, Julian's auctions, and this bidder on the property that this bidder wanted to buy. The, basically, the issue was Julian's auctions contracted with the Michael Jackson estate to sell X number of items through auction. They started the auction, there were bidders, hundreds of bidders active in this auction, and in the middle of the auction, like a week before it was supposed to be over, I think it was a two or three week auction window, the family decided, no, we don't want to auction this stuff off. Right in the middle of all the bidding. <laughs> so, Julian's obviously was not very happy as being a major auction house, but what could they do? They, the, the, the Michael Jackson family was their, uh, their client. Who was angry about this? Well, the high bidder of the property that the, they decided to cancel the auction. So this guy su sued the Michael Jackson estate and Julian's auctions. Um, the bidder was ar arguing that he, had, he should have the right to purchase this material he bid on at that high price when the cutoff came. And of course the lawyers for the defendants said, no, you know, we have the right to do whatever we want. You know, it's, if, if we had brought the auction to the end and you would want it, yes, that's fine, but we could do whatever we want. So it was a very interesting case. I was called in to appraise all of the material that was under contention. There was about 85 items, uh, ultimately, that the, the Julians and, and uh, family, Michael Jackson family, were saying they didn't want to get rid of. So those 85 items became the, the subject of the lawsuit. I spent a lot of time at the ranch where a lot of this material, the Michael Jackson Neverland Ranch, where the, this, this material was held. There was a lot of material out at the Los Angeles airport where I went to look at. Um, and then, and then we, we did our research, our appraisal of all this material. 
found out what the potential value would be in various scenarios, whether it was sold quickly or whether it was going to be auctioned again, etc. And then we had the trial. I was called as an expert witness uh, and laid out my case for why I thought these various items were worth such and such money. Kind of kitsch material, but collectible, certainly, with a certain amount of value to people who, who like Michael Jackson. Had a, had a really enjoyable time, as far as I'm concerned, with speaking about the case and being cross-examined. And you know, it's my, my opinion. It's an opinion of value. And this is what the research shows that the items were worth. Well, ironically, as the uh, case turned out, my testimony proved to be irrelevant as far as the jury was concerned in terms of what the legal issue was. Legal issue wasn't what the value of this material was. The legal issue was did they have the right to cancel the auction? And the jury felt, yes, they did have the right to cancel the auction. Which you can look at from either way, you know, is that fair? Is it fair to people who assume they have a contract with you when they're bidding on something? They have to, you know, fill out a registration form and actually be proactive in bidding and following the auction. So it wasn't my decision to make, but that's how it turned out. And those 85 items went back to the Michael Jackson estate until a couple years later when they went back on auction. <laughs> So, hey, you know, what can you say? That's how life goes. So that's, that's one, one uh, uh, situation where, uh, where my, my uh, expertise came into play, though ultimately wasn't, wasn't needed. But, I, hey, I was glad to do the job anyway. It was, it was fun. So another case, I, I'm often called by lawyers and, and um, insurance people when there's a divorce. And as I mentioned earlier, the uh, wife doesn't know what the husband's got. So oftentimes record collectors, we're talking about record collectors, uh, have large collections. And being a, a record collector can be a very insular job, insular hobby. You, you have your likes, your dislikes, you have your fandom, you collect certain things. And often very few other people know what you actually have. In... I've seen several divorce cases where the wife doesn't have any idea what the value is of the, her husband's record collection. So she obviously hires a lawyer to handle the, the divorce, and the lawyer doesn't know anything about it. You know, they've all heard that, oh, you know, no one cares about records anymore, that, you know, they're, you got them at the Goodwill for $2 each. So then they look to me, and I look at this college and say, well, you know, there's this, and this, and this. This is, this is a $50,000 collection, $100,000 collection. And everyone's jaw drops, and they say, we had no idea. This is worth more than anything else they've declared in this case. So <laughs> my evaluation of fair market value in these cases can be very critical to determining whether these two, two parties to the divorce are getting a fair deal. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's a very common scenario for me in appraisal. So I wanted to talk a little bit about legal in an appraisal. What makes an appraisal that I would do valuable, right? uh, valuable to the parties who would have the appraisal done? So first and foremost about an appraisal, particularly uh, an appraisal done by an accredited appraiser, is that we conform to a very specific methodology, the way that we conduct our appraisal, our research, our evaluation research, follows a standard called the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice, USPAP for short. This is a set of, of standards, rules, methodology that was formulated by the Appraisal Standards Board of the Appraisal Foundation of Washington, D.C. It's kind of an umbrella organization that all the other appraisal organizations, the, the ASA, the ISA, etc., subscribe to their tenants so that there's basically standards industry-wide that everyone accepts and follows. Uh, and it, this goes back to an act of Congress uh, 30, 30 years or, or so ago. Uh, if, if you're familiar with appraisal in real estate, the state of California requires that you get an appraisal. But there is no 
legally required appraisal needed in any other field. And consequently, 20, 30, 40 years ago, for personal property appraisal, appraisal of coins, of stamps, of, of furniture, of paintings, it was the Wild West. There were no standards. There was lots of fraud. That's why the Appraisal Standards Board was created to bring some real clarity to the situation and establish some rules by which we could then go to the public and say, we're legitimate, we're following fairness standards, a methodology that can meet legal standards. So that's what, what started and that's what we all follow. And this uh, use PAP is revised every two years. The current edition, 2018-2019, is the current edition that's in effect. If you do an appraisal between now and the end of 2019, you have to follow what's in this manual. And then every two years we get a new edition. Everyone has to take training in the specific changes, update, update their and go forward. So this is part of the credential process. The reason why I would consider myself a credentialed appraiser is because I follow the methodology of USPAP. I have the education requirements that are set up by both the appraisals board and my specific association, the American Society of Appraisers, has very specific training that I need to take, specific classes and experience. I need to show that I am an, at least a semi-expert in my field of music, in records, in memorabilia, and I've been doing this for X number of years. I've taken certain exams, I've taken tests, and I have a regular system reaccreditation. It's not enough that 10 years ago I passed all these courses and got my certificate, but every two years I have to reapply and say, okay, I'm still up with the standards, I'm still up with the training, I have, I have what it takes to do this properly. And, and in case it's, it's um, challenged in court, I can put up a credible defense of my, my valuation. So just finally about legal aspects of an appraisal, it all comes down to the ethics rule that the Appraisal Foundation has formulated. The bottom line is the reason why we do this is to promote and preserve the public trust. That's the whole reason like USPAP was created, why the appraisal board was created, because there was no public trust when you got an appraisal. Uh, in the old days, I said, I've got, I've got an automobile, <coughs> antique automobile worth $100,000. I want an appraisal for $100,000. I'd go to an appraiser and say, yeah, I want this appraisal for $100,000. Okay, yeah, that, the appraisal cost will be 10% of what your appraised value will be. So $10,000 and I'll do it for $100,000. Oh, you know what? Maybe should be two hundred thousand dollars. Okay, that'll cost you twenty thousand dollars. I mean, that's <laughs> that was one example of what was often done. So now, if you want that automobile appraised, you're going to have to find out what is that automobile automobile actually selling for in the market. You know, what is it actually selling for? Oh, it's only sixteen thousand dollars. I'm sorry, that's what your appraisal is going to be sixteen thousand, not not a hundred thousand uh, dollars. So there's some other ethics rules that we follow. I've just outlined a couple here, you know, protecting the client. Uh, the fee structure is not contingent on what the value is. It's an hourly rate or a set rate. It has nothing to do with what my results are going to be. So just continuing on a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of what we do. Uh, when a client, potential client, approaches me and asks me, I need an appraisal for X reason, um, I ask them a bunch of questions about what it is they have. Obviously, I need to know as much as possible what they have, why they need it appraised, and, and a little bit more about its background. With that information, I create what I call a letter of agreement. It, it outlines the scope of work. What will I do to deliver the results they need, depending on what kind of uh, purpose, whether it's a donation, whether it's an estate's issue, some taxation issue, etc. Then I describe in this document my methodology. How will I go about doing that? You know, what will I look at to come up with the results I need? And then with my estimate of the time and cost. This way, the client and everyone knows what's expected right at the outset. There's no surprises. And in all my years of doing appraisals, I've never gone over my estimate. I think maybe one or two cases where my, the final cost was over the estimate because the client changed 
the material being appraised or some other thing came up. But um, I try to be as accurate as possible right out the gate so there's no surprises. And occasionally, we, we have to make this point. What is this appraisal that you're doing? Well, it's an argument. I'm making an argument in this document, doing this research, writing all this stuff down, showing you that the value I'm coming up with is legitimate, is based on facts that I'm finding in the marketplace. It's fundamentally argument to value. And that's why I feel secure in the document I give you as an appraisal can stand up in court if I'm ever cross-examined cross on why I did what I did. Because I'm following the USPAP methodology, which is very specific. So that's enough about the appraisal process. Let's just talk about some nuts and bolts about what you might find, not perhaps in your professional business, but just at a friend's house in your own. What are things worth finding out of, you know, an old 45 or some, some piece button here? So you may say, oh, well, that's not worth anything. Oh, yeah, those, I used to see those all around, that, those buttons. Everyone wore those buttons. Well, the first rule is never underestimate the value of anything until you know. Don't assume. And I've put these old comic books up here because this is probably the classic case where people had no idea that comic books would be able to buy houses in the future. Everyone threw out their comics at some point in time even me, <laughs> and you know, you just can't make any assumptions about what things are worth anymore, okay? So uh, it, it ruins family relationships, interpersonal relationships, and financial ties all the time when people make assumptions about value when they don't have the information that they need. All right, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the, the situation here. So in general, the prices of record and music memorabilia are going up and also the prestige of the field is going up. Until maybe the last 10 years, record collecting has been the wild west of all collecting. It was like there was no standards, there, was, there were major dealers, major, uh, major uh, sellers, there were high priced items, low priced items, there, there was condition was all over the map. It was the wild west. There was, but, and it was pretty low, low value. You never got investors or major auction houses in that, interested in it. But over the last 10 years, the situation's changed with some major players who've provided the information to understand the hobby better and to understand how, what the, this tra the trajectory of prices have been. And so you can actually see how this field has matured and improved over time. And I've listed a couple, Discogs and eBay are probably the two major players with information resources that record collectors and music memorabilia collectors look at to see what the market looks like. And I'll go into a little more detail about these later. But uh, it's, 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 uh, it's interesting to me is how much acute hindsight record collectors have. Oh, I used to have that. I got rid of it years ago. It wasn't worth anything, but now, now it's five hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, or whatever. So, just like comic books. So, again, never assume. Never assume. So, in terms of what the actual market is, there's a huge market for collecting this material, and now for investors, uh, Discogs, D-I-S-C-O-G-S dot com. Discogs is the go-to place for record collectors now because. They, they started out with the goal of being a dis discography, a, a site on the web where every record ever released would have, a, have details about it. You go by an artist's name, you see every record ever released by that artist in any format, in any country. Very ambitious. Millions and millions of records. And once they got uh, enough data on their site, they started letting the collectors and the dealers on to say, oh, I have this record, I can sell it to you. So consequently, over the last few years, they've amassed a huge amount of data about the records that have been sold through their site, and they are now the most accurate method for determining what the common values are for rare records and common records. You can find $2 records on there as well as $15,000 records on there. 
Consequently, investors are moving into this field because if they see that this a particular item is for, you know, six months ago was selling for $5,000 and now is going for $7,000 and the, the trend has been upward for the last six months, they're getting into the field to buy some of these higher priced items and holding on to it until it becomes even more valuable. And there's many examples where that has happened often, often. So as a consequence, it used to be just eBay. eBay was the place where you went to post your records for sale and, and buy and sell, and it's still a huge market. But it's become increasingly so crowded with amateurs and non-professionals that it's not a reliable gauge anymore of accurate prices in the market. Yes, you're going to find high prices on eBay and low prices on eBay, but it's not going to be what is the, the, the average or the real mean. You have to go to the other sites, such as Discogs and major auction houses like Julian's again, Sotheby's, Heritage Auctions, the specialty auction houses that deal in music and the memorabilia attached to it to find out really where prices are trending in, in a professional sense. As I said, eBay is still good for finding those bargains. You have a lot of uh, ignorant people who, who post a record that's worth $2 and they want $20,000 for it. It's not going to sell. And then it confuses the, the amateurs to say, well, I saw this record. It was listed for $20,000. Yeah, but did anyone pay $20,000 for it? That's the big question, of course. So the, the situation is very fluid, but it is maturing and rapidly becoming much more professional than it ever was. And consequently, it's interesting, interested now among the major players in the auction market. So let's talk with some definitions. This is going to help you really understand what you could look for in various scenarios. So records. What do we mean by records? Well, most of you know what an LP is, you know, your classic 12-inch record, a record album, a Beatles album, you know, a Nirvana record, a, a Shostakovich, Beethoven symphony, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also 45s. Seven-inch records, the single song on a side, the classic 45, those are records. But we also talk about 78s, the, the pre-LP, large, brittle, hard record of the 20s, 30s, and 40s. We talk about eight tracks, a format that you just put in your car and, and run down the road playing. That's, that's a, a, a very popular format among collectors now. Cassettes. Everyone knows what cassettes are. Cassettes were dead when, uh, when the CD came out. But now, guess what? Record companies are now putting out cassettes again. It's now a, a trendy format for a lot of indie bands, cassettes. And there's antique formats like the original Edison cylinders, which were introduced in the 1880s, 1890s, the first recorded format. Flexi discs, which are thin little plastic wobbly discs that usually were given away free. Those often have very collectible and rare recordings on them. EPs, extended plays, those are seven inch records, usually the same sizes as 45s, but they've got two songs on a side and usually a nice cover. They were very popular in Europe and England, not very common in the United States. 12 inch singles, same size as an LP, but usually one song on a side, very high uh, quality because it's one song spinning at 45 or 33, and usually for disco and early rap songs were found on promo 12-inch singles. And even CDs are collectible. Everyone's saying, oh, in the world of streaming and downloading, compact discs, no one wants them. You can find them for a buck or less, you know, by, by the millions in thrift stores these days. But there are some very rare and valuable CDs. And like any musical format, there will be collectors of, a very, of specific kinds of this music. It's not something you can ignore just off the top of your head. But this is just records, our recorded material we've been talking about. Music memorabilia is a huge field with lots of things that come under its banner. T-shirts, some of the highest priced things you'll find are old concert T-shirts by bands that sell for hundreds of dollars each. You might you know, buy them new in a concert for $10, and now they were produced just for that one concert. Now everyone wants it because it's a band they like, or a musician, or it's rare. Posters, paper goods, 
posters and handbills, the smaller size uh, sheets of paper. Pound for pound, posters and handbills are worth much more than records. They tend to be rare, they tend to be more colorful and interesting historically, and there's a huge and very active market for posters. Related to that, tickets, programs, anything related to a specific concert, very collectible. And again, generally more valuable to collectors than the records themselves. Again, more music memorabilia, promotional photographs, press kits, things that were only distributed to the press or to a very small insider group. Collectors want them. They didn't get a chance to get them when they were new. Now they have to buy them on the secondary market. Things like signed photographs, press kits that have photos and bio information about artists. These can be very, very valuable. Up here, I've illustrated the original press kit for the Sex Pistols album released on Warner Brothers in America in 1977. That press kit folds open. There's like four or five photographs of the band. There's about 10 different sheets of paper in there. Talk about bio and the history of the band, et cetera, et cetera. That sells for well over one or $200 now on the market. When again, it was just distributed for free to a few people in the media when it came out. Just an example. Don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. Also, don't ignore bubblegum wrappers. <laughs> I brought this out. There, there's bubblegum cards that, that are incredibly expensive because, again, like comic books, people took them for granted. Usually younger people initially bought them and they discarded them. They didn't think of anything about them. And now they're gone. And if you want an Elvis set of bubblegum cards, 50, I think there's 54, something like that in the complete set, complete set in really mint condition with that wrapper, it costs you $500 or more. So don't ignore anything you see lying around a room when you're, when you got, you know, oh, you've got paintings, you've got furniture and you've got clothing. Well, there's all these records and junk over here on the, on the, on the, on the bed stand, but take a closer look at what's there. You may be surprised. All right, so music memorabilia is even more than that. And here's another area that can be very, very lucrative, record awards. There's a very, very big market in these very nice display pieces, plaques basically, uh, of two kinds. There's official awards that were awarded to an artist or someone related to the artist, music publicity perhaps, management, etc., to acknowledge their participation in, say, a hit record or a hit album, or some major concert tour. The Record uh, Association of America awards these plaques to musicians and other artists to acknowledge this, usually based on billboard chart rankings or sales. Those are official awards. But there's this whole new market of commemorative awards. The one in the middle, this is a, a, a plaque uh, a, for Meatloaf. You might remember Meatloaf. This was something you could buy in a store or online. It wasn't an official award, but it sold for several hundred dollars when it was new and now has gone up in value because it was a limited edition. But it's not what we call an official award. The Grammy Museum, the Grammy, excuse me, the Grammy Awards, uh, which is there on the right side, similar, uh, awarded for uh, participation in, in specific events very rare, much rarer than the plaques. Very valuable because they don't come on the market very often. So this is another field that's worth exploring. And I, I don't mean to belabor the point that there's a, this is a huge field that can't be ignored. Signed instruments, uh, signed memorabilia is very, very lucrative. In fact, a lot of musicians are now marketing their own instruments signed. And, and there's, this is, again, an area of, of litigation because a lot of signatures turn out to be phony. Uh, a, an artist may license a series of signed guitars to a manufacturer and they'll sign one guitar and then they'll have other people sign all the other guitars with the same signature. And that's been the subject to lawsuits. Um, so pr uh, provenance of signed instruments and authentication of signatures is a big field that is growing for people who, who can figure this out because the prices are going up and up. This, this signed uh, 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 Prince guitar in the middle uh, could be $150,000 if it's a real 
Prince guitar. Say a Beethoven symphony, you've got 85 instruments in a symphony performing that symphony and you have a part for each instrument. And since it's a long symphony, the violin part could be 75 pages and you've got 85 parts to that orchestra. And you've got the main part, which is the conductor's part. So you've got 85 parts for a symphony. What do they sell for? If you bought it new, it could be $900, $1,200. That's why music schools and libraries are so willing to accept these donations of these large libraries of music scores. Again, something not to ignore if it comes your way. Speaking of paper, anything related to music that's signed, a bill, a receipt for something, very collectible. Um, I've done appraisals where I, I had to appraise all the, the tour documents for a management company, for booking concerts around the country for various musicians. Uh, they may or may not be signed. That's not relevant. What's relevant is the historical uh, aspects of this material. And a lot of museums and archives are looking actively for this. And thus, it's very big in the donation field. And we've talked briefly about signatures. This is probably the, one of the hottest area for, for contentiousness in, the, in this memorabilia field because the, the prices are so outrageous for some of the top artists, the Beatles, obviously, Elvis Presley, now Prince, Kurt Cobain of Nirvana, even Frank Sinatra, some of the other major uh, uh, pop uh, vocalists of the, of the last century. Signature authentication is a burgeoning field because the prices are so high now and they're getting even higher for real things. This, this Beatles autograph here, authenticated, accurate, could be anywhere from fifteen dollars to $25,000, this little piece of paper that a, a girl in England had on her autograph book. It's just like three by five piece of paper. And she saw them at a show and had them sign it. And that's what it's worth now. So again, some of the things that we deal with in this field, it's very large. There's a lot of material. And I haven't covered all of it. But some things that you need to be aware of if you happen upon a collector who has more than just records. They may have more than that. As I said, in terms of what your strategy could be for uncovering this stuff, obviously you need to look. <laughs> but since a record collector mentality tends to be secretive, insular, they don't share a lot of information, except maybe with other collectors, you need to understand what you're dealing with and figure out what's really there. You don't have to be an expert in knowing everything, but you need to know whether it's worth knowing about. And that's what I'm hoping that you'll pick up some of that information uh, in, in this, this presentation today. Because the people you're dealing with in a, a divorce or a property issue or a state, may, they may not know themselves what they have. They may not know. They may not appreciate the value that they have. So many collectors themselves don't appreciate that this box of old paper goods is really worth more than all the records they have on their shelf. Some of these areas that, that need to be looked at in detail with insurance people. Insurance adjusters tend to be really ignorant of the true market for music memorabilia. I found time and time again they always lowball the claim that's being made by, by the client because, well, number one, the client didn't file an appraisal the first time around when they took, the, when they took out the, the uh, uh, insurance. And so now when they have a loss, they're saying, oh, well, this, this, this uh, signed photo is worth $10,000. And the insurance adjuster will say, well, was it appraised? Uh, do you have the signatures authenticated? Uh, what kind of signatures were they? What, did it look really nice? Was it just a torn piece of paper, et cetera, et cetera? So partly an appraiser can help establish the parameters in which you can argue effectively against an insurance adjuster's claim against value. We can tell you what to look for. We can tell you what the potential value is. We can help assess for you to make your argument more effective. Loan, collateral, more and more record collections are being used to establish uh, uh, loans. I, I, they get an appraisal for a collection. It's worth X amount of dollars. 
and they work with a bank or some other loan shark <laughs> to take money based on that uh, based on that collection. And like art collections, they can be used as collateral for a loan, and lawyers often come into play in establishing the contract between the loan loaner and the loanee, loanee loaner in this case. Okay. It's basically how is value being used in this case. Probably the biggest area that I've been working in lately is donations. Uh, and you would think that at some point in time, everyone's going to have that Beatle record, or everyone's going to have that, that Frank Sinatra collection, or everyone's going to have that, that punk music collection, or that classical collection, but no, it's not true. There are many archives and museums and university collections around the country who are looking very actively for, for all sorts of material. And consequently, a lot of people are willing to donate their collections. And I've been doing a lot of donation appraisals. Now, what makes this a little difficult is that the IRS is continually refining the rules for donations, what it is going to take to prove that what you have is worth X amount of value. And they're becoming more and more uh, you know, scrutinized, these, these donations that are sent in with their tax re returns more and more. So even though a collector can benefit seriously from a donation, uh, they often need advice in how this donation is going to be positioned. It's not only an issue for their tax person, their accountant, but often their lawyer in figuring out what is the best thing to do. Should I donate this all now? Do I break it up? What are the rules that are going to be between me and the recipient organization? Uh, I need a contract between them so that they won't sell the stuff right away or they will display it a certain way. They will have the collection available for research in a certain way. It will be called a certain thing. It will have my name on it, right? So that everyone will know that I donated it, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, litigious situations that come upon donations that don't work out right in that sense. Uh, regarding donations, some of the specific things that the IRS requests is this form 8283, which basically is signed both by the donor, by the appraiser, and by the recipient organization, proving that they have, they have this stuff, it's worth X amount of money, and I've accepted it gladly, uh, and I'm an appropriate organization. What's, what's very uh, uh, crucial in a donation is that it's an appropriate donation. If you want to maximize the amount of value you get from your donation, make sure it's going to some place that's going to use it appropriately. You have music scores that are donated to a music school. You have records, you're going to a record library. But if you donate your records to Goodwill, well, what's Goodwill going to do? They, they, they'll just turn around and sell them, you know? So you're not going to get what might be the collectible fair market value of your records or your sheet music or your awards you're going to get what Goodwill sells them for, two bucks each or whatever it might be. That's called a turnaround donation. You want to avoid that situation. And appropriate use, again, is something the IRS really looks for. So let's just talk briefly about some of these. These, these are projects I've worked on, uh, just how these organizations used an appraisal. The University of Miami uh, hired me to appraise a very, very large music library of scores that were donated to them by a defunct symphony orchestra. And this was for not insurance purpose, not for donation value, but they wanted to know what the value was so they could promote it to their, their, their donors and their, uh, the people who support the university, saying, look, we have this major donation. It's worth X millions of dollars. Isn't that nice? We should continue to receive things. Please send us your goods. That took a, that was a great time in Miami. Went to the Everglades. We had a great time, but <laughs> it was, it was a lot of work in a, in a, in a room filled with musty documents. Okay. Um, the Grammy Museum, I mentioned them before. Uh, a lot of people are donating material to the Grammy Museum, which actually as an institution, the Grammy Museum is relatively new and they're a little late to the gate. 
they are behind schedule in terms of the sorts of material they have compared to, say, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or the Experience Museum in Seattle or even some of the regional museums like the Mississippi Blues Museum, et cetera. The Grammy Museum has been catching up. They've been buying collections and they've been soliciting donations to amplify their uh, educational resources of the history of the Grammy Museum, the history of, of music that, uh, that have been uh, subject to their awards over the history of, of their existence. And so there's a lot of donations that are now coming into the Grammy Museum. Stanford Museum has one of the largest collections of ethnomusicology in the country, along with UCLA, uh, as well as some of the greatest collections of early music, 78s, Edison cylinders, even the prehistory of music. And they are, again, actively soliciting donations, one of the world's largest collections, and I'm seeing donations constantly going to the, the Stanford Museum. <clears throat> now, the Archive of Contemporary Music is an interesting situation. They are located in New York City, and their stated purpose is to collect every record released in the world since World War II <laughs> from every country. Right now, currently, I think they have something like 15 million records in their holdings, and it's more all the time. Uh, they work in conjunction with the Internet Archive, based in San Francisco. The Internet Archive, among the many things the Internet Archive does, is they're digitizing every book published. They are digitizing every record made. So the Archive gets the physical materials, they give them to the Internet Archive to digitize, and then they get the physical material to archive in New York and elsewhere, because they're gradually filling up their space in New York City. This is the go-to place I always refer clients to who can't find a home for their records, because they will take just about everything, even if they've already got it, even if the records are a low value, you know, Montavani and, you know, your, your Herb Alpert records, the archive will gladly accept those records because that's what they're all about, you know? And they get, it's, a, it's a, an appropriate use. So the IRS says, that's great. This is a, an archive of music and of records. So yes, it's appropriate use. So that's good for everybody concerned in that regard. Let's talk briefly about auctions. Auctions are, are a specific kind of issue that comes up uh, in litigious situations because as we saw, saw with the Michael Jackson case, there's always going to be unhappy bidders and unhappy sellers. It happens all the time that someone has got something for up for auction and they don't want to auction it. They cancel the auction. It's not exactly as it was described. The owner of the auction says, oh, it didn't sell for the price I wanted. Lawyers are called upon all the time to deal with the various parties of an auction uh, for various issues. Um, I, I said here, you know, it's bidders sue the auction houses, auction houses sue the bidders. It's a sue marathon, basically. Lots going on there. And the major auction houses like Sotheby's and Cooper Owen are, have been joined by specialty auction houses like Heritage and, Ju and Julian's to deal with very expensive music memorabilia, more and more expensive music memorabilia. I would say the average Julian's auction, when they have them, they have them about six times a year. I'd say overall, for all of the types of material that they sell in an auction, it's easily five to ten million dollars each auction. And that, that's, you see that all the way down the line. Heritage auction deals with not just music, but comic books and other collectible material, and then millions and millions of dollars trading hands every, every, uh, every quarter for their auctions. Uh, and so it's definitely worth checking in with the auction house action because uh, there's always problems that as, as the prices rise, the issues arise more and more. Authentication of issues, this authentication, signature uh, provenance, etc. Let's get further into the nitty gritty and talk about what you need to look for if you're gonna try to figure out whether this stuff is even worth dealing for. So I'm gonna tell you give you a quick guide on some of the things that you can, you, you can identify in a collection as to whether or not it's worth paying attention to. Because let's face it, if you have 10,000 records and they're all dollar thrift store records, 
you don't want to spend much time dealing with that. You don't want to hire me as an appraiser of that collection. You know it's just junk, basically. But how do you know it's not junk? Well, let me give you some tips. So obviously there's many exceptions to what I'm going to say here, but here's some of the things to look for that if they're in a collection, it's a red flag that, oh, I need to pay attention to this. Audiophile pressings. These are special limited edition pressings of records, mostly LPs, but sometimes 45s, that are done in very small batches, that are done very high quality. Uh, they might be famous records, you know, Beatles records, Rolling Stones, um, famous classical albums, but they're reprints, reissues, but in very limited editions. They tend to sell new at a high price, $25, $35, $45, $50 at a time, new, but they go out of print right away, and a collection that has a large number of the, uh, these audiophile pressings can be, you can easily find hundreds, records worth hundreds of dollars in, in a collection with, with these sorts of records in them. In terms of classical music, one major area is avant-garde music, music of the 20th, 20th century. Edgar Varese, John Cage, electronic music, wacko and weird music that's considered classical music, but not popular music. One reason is, again, the music was never really popular when it was issued. Small quantities. These artists have become much more famous now than they were when they first had their first records released. And you can't find the original pressings. Some of them are very expensive. Weird music is worth looking out for. This is, this is we, uh, it's a general t word, weird music, but you know it when you see it. It's like privately made records that just have weird looking covers. You can't tell what kind of genre of music it is. You can tell that they paid some company to press this record. Well, tell you the truth, that's one of the hottest areas of collecting now. There's whole books devoted to, to private weird music pressings. And again, some of the stuff is very, very rare because they just made enough copies to give to their family, perhaps, you know? That's one thing to look for. It's called outsider music, right? Bootleg records. Bootleg records started in the late 60s with Bob Dylan and Beatles records, and now almost every artist has boot bootleg records. One reason why bootleg records are very collectible is there's very few places to sell them. You can't sell them on eBay. You can't sell them on Discogs. You have to go under the under the wire to sell a bootleg record. Consequently, some of them are worth hundreds of dollars each. Let's talk a little bit more about classical music. In general, classical music is not worth much. If you see a large collection of classical music, you need to quickly identify a few things in there, but generally, it's not going to be worth your while, particularly box sets like opera box sets, forget it. But some of the most valuable records of any kind of record are string quartets from the 1950s. Some of these very uh, uh, notable bands like the Amadeus String Quartet and the Hollywood String Quartet, old records from 1953, 54, 55, before stereo, because the, the sound quality was excellent, was superb, superbly engineered records. The Japanese bought up so many of these records in the 70s, 80s, now they're almost impossible to find in this country. Colored vinyl records, always, always interesting to find whatever kind of music it is. Colored vinyl, people always buy that. One field that's, that's really hot now among uh, rock collectors is early 70s European progressive rock records. We call it Euro rock or Kraut rock or Prague rock. Uh, bands like Can and Noi, Tangerine Dream, they turned out to be very, very influential, particularly in the 70s and 80s among the punk and the post-punk crowd. But early 70s progressive rock, I see records regularly priced $500, $1,000, $2,000 each now or more. Very expensive. And as usual, garage and psychedelic music of the 60s, still very hot, still very expensive for the rarities. And coming up there, soul and funk records from the 60s and early 70s. In fact, when I started this presentation, I showed you that record that I said sold for $35,000. That's in a category, a genre of music we call Northern Soul. Northern soul is soul music that wasn't a hit, basically. Records released in the late 60s, early 70s by artists that no one ever heard of at the time, and now 
because of some DJs in Scotland in the 80s discovered these records, started playing them, everyone was dancing to them, it started the, the rush for everyone to try to find these records. And now, since they weren't popular, they didn't sell in, quanti in large quantities, sometimes only a handful exist, 500, 2,000, 10,000 dollars, very average prices for the rarest soul records. Jazz records, the early 50, uh, 50s and the 1960s, the original pressings of jazz, post-bop, bebop pressings, particularly what's called the deep groove. Those are the original way that the plastic was pressed. There's a deep groove underneath the label that shows it's the first pressing. There's people who say, I just want a deep groove pressing. Well, okay, if you want to spend $500, you can get that, uh, that, that record. Uh, rare movie soundtracks, but only the earliest movie soundtracks the 50s and 60s soundtracks. Generally, modern, modern, press, modern releases are not worth much. White label pressings, promotional only pressings, those tend to be rare and valuable because they're higher quality value, uh, vinyl. The, the first pressings are usually the white label promotional pressings that go to DJs and the media, and they're usually higher quality than what the retail versions are. Punk music. Late 70s punk music, original pressings from, the, from 75, 76, 77, 78, incredible prices it's getting now in the market because, again, it was a niche field at the time, and a lot of the records were what we call DIY, do-it-yourself, privately pressed, small runs, now very rare, very collectible. Similarly, rock and roll of the 50s, the original pressings, original Elvis pressing, Elvis Pressings, the original Little Richard, uh, Johnny Burnett Rock and Roll Trio, Little Richard, all the classic 50s rockers, the original first pressings of their albums in good condition. Condition trumps everything. You can find an Elvis Presley record, but it's going to be destroyed, chances are, because everyone played it to death. If you find it in near mint condition, the, the, the price of that goes up a hundredfold. It could be worth $5 in average condition, could be worth $500 in really near mint condition. Just content, continuing, solo cello works in classical fields, some of the most valuable records, are solo instruments. And stereo, early stereo records, RCA Living Stereo, London Blueback, and Mercury Living Presence are three of the premium classical stereo releases from the late 50s and early 60s that tend to have very high prices, okay? And then just imports, classical music from England and Germany. Older 50s and 60s records can be very valuable. Now, briefly about 78s. Most 78s are worth little or nothing. I wouldn't bother with 78s because most 78s are worth little. What, what did people buy when they bought 78s in the 40s and 50s? They bought our parents' music, called our parents' music. Big band, swing era stuff, Patti Page, Vaughn Monroe, Frank Sinatra on 78, very popular, sold in the hundreds of thousands of copies. Even today, they're common. If you wanted to buy a 78 by a popular artist from 1945, you can pay $2 for it. It's fairly easy. Of course, there's exceptions. There's incredibly rare 78s, but in general, unless the style of music points itself as something different, it's not going to be worth much at all. So what is worth 78? Blues. Rhythm and blues, R&B, early jazz records. We're talking about pre-1940, not big band, not swing. Early jazz records, ethnic music, world music. These are the 78s that are very rare and very, very valuable, and you probably won't ever see them in a collection because they're already in museums. But just in case you do, more categories to look for in 78, late 50s rock and roll, soul, rockabilly, UK classical. Again. Most collectors of this material are specialists, and you'll know that immediately. If it's just a general collection of 78s, chances are it's not going to be worth finding out about. So just continuing what not to look for, big band, swing era music, particularly on 78, not going to be worth your time. The standard repertoire classical LPs, you know, your Beethoven symphonies, your Schubert symphonies, your, your Shostakovich, your Mahler, your Mozart, Bach. No one cares if it's the standard repertoire, the pieces that everyone has, okay? Comedy, sad to say, comedy is not very collectible, even though there are many rare comedy records out there. It's just not a field that's worth investing time in. Mainstream rock 
CDs. Millions of copies. That was the high watermark of vinyl production. Generally, that stuff is too common to be worth your while. Popular singer-songwriters, James Taylor, Carol King, etc., the early 70s singer-songwriters, again, the same field, same area, uh, too common, too popular. Musicals, show tunes, no one's collecting it, except at the very rough, rarest edges of it. And again, I mentioned the pre-rock and roll pop vocalists, you know, Perry Como, Vaughn Monroe, Frank Sinatra, no one cares, don't worry about it. So... That's a very brief overview, what to care about and what not to care about. And I want to show you one example here about why it's important to know what you're dealing with. Here we have a Beatles album that many people have seen. It's called Introducing the Beatles, 1964, January 64. It was released at the same time as the Beatles' appearance on Ed Sullivan, the British Invasion. This was put out on DJ Records, Introducing the Beatles. I have three copies here. Why do I have three copies here? Because there's three different versions of it. This first version down, down there is worth up to $1,000 in really good condition if it looks like this. If you notice, the back cover has lists of the songs on it. Okay, And it's, uh, this particular copy has stereo. It's a stereo version. But here's a copy that could be worth up to $3,000 that doesn't have anything on the back cover. It's called the blank back version. And then here we have one that could be up to $15,000 that has ads for different DJ albums on the back cover. Now, why did they do this? Well, the first version was the one with the ads, the top one. When they rushed release this, they didn't have any information. They didn't even know what songs were on this album. They just wanted to get it out quickly because Capitol Records had their own Beatles album out and they just appeared on Ed Sullivan. Everyone wanted Beatles records, so they put out this ad on the back cover. So a week or two later, they said, all right, well, we finally got the song list, but we, we, we have to keep putting these records out. So before we get the mock-up for the songs, we'll just put it out with the blank cover. No one will care. They just want a Beatles record. So they put out a blank cover. And finally, they put out a version with the song titles. Now, even the song titles, there's two different versions, but I won't go into that. But just give you an idea that here's three albums with three very different prices. In fact, these are probably old prices, and I think the prices have even gone up. But with this particular album, beware. All of these are worth nothing. <laughs> this has been the most counterfeited album in history. I would say 90% of the time when you find this album, it's a counterfeit and it's worthless. Why is that the case? Well... In January 1964, VJ put this album out, and they lost the rights. Capital sued them, and Capital took the rights away for VJ to distribute them. So what did they do? They quickly flooded the market with these counterfeits to sell what they could over the course of 1964 when they didn't have the rights to sell this record. And so you find all kinds of variations of it, you know, different colorations, you know, stereo, mono. They're not, there's no stereo. There's, they're all mono, even though they say stereo, et cetera. And you find this constantly. But, again, if you, if you go back and you find any of these that are real, and there are ways to tell, that's worth some real money. So bottom line, I just want to talk about the future of it. In general, prognosticating here. The rarest, most expensive items will only get rare and more expensive. Going, definitely going to be a field that major investors are involved in that is going to be prices you'll see approaching fine art, rare coins, rare comic books. There's always going to be disagreements over value, over transactions that occur, over condition of things, over ownership. It'll only get more intense as time goes on. And as this field matures, as standards for condition, for accepting what what specific version you have of something becomes more well-known and accepted, there's always going to be conf conflicts because these are turning into rare cultural artifacts. This first Beatles album was made one time only for a short time in 1964, and that's the very first original one. And as farther and farther we get from that, Whatever legacy the Beatles are going to have in the future, there's still only going to be that one point in time where that one item was released. It will always have artifactual value. So, again, my bottom line is don't assume anything until you know. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for watching. If you would like to see more videos by California Lawyers for the Arts, please like and subscribe to CLA's YouTube channel so we can provide full service live streaming programs soon. Our channel will be producing videos that cover all kinds of artistic, entertainment, and intellectual property legal issues. You can also find our videos on Facebook and livestream.com.